So today we're not going to talk about performance problems as the schedule says, because unfortunately uh, the speaker Christian was ill, he had throat problems and he could not do that talk. So Sophie asked me to stand in and I took the session from uh, DrupalCon Barcelona, uh, which is called Spatial Drupal. Go ahead, sit down please. And I should put on my clicker. Right. So I, hello, I'm Floris van Geel. I call myself a Drupal entrepreneur, which means that about 30% of my time I do my own stuff, and about 70% of the time I work for clients. This fluctuates a bit, and in January I hope to go back to these numbers again. Uh, my company is called 040 Lab. It's a small company in the south of the Netherlands, in Eindhoven. We have uh, five people. And today I'm going to talk about how to use Drupal for different content than we usually do. So not text, no images, no videos, not that kind of stuff. I'm going to talk about uh, GIS system, so mapping, Urbania, so city development with a Drupal, uh, building management, and as a sort of a source over all of that, the Internet of Everything, which comes after the Internet of Things, of course. So mapping. In the old days, we believed that the world was flat, like a pancake. And if you would tumble it over, and there and here is a link, and you get a uh, 3D3 thing to make this, and you would fall off. Until the point that this guy, Mr. Mercator, he made a projection system. And with a projection system, we have nice uh, latitude longitude on the world, and with that we can navigate and um, get back home safely while sailing or driving a car. Google revolutionized this Mercator system for they made the world flat again. And again a pancake. And they created the web mapping tile. And if you look closely at it, you see that things like Greenland are much too high and Russia is much too wide. It's because of the flat projection of an orange-shaped globe. But when you zoom in, it get, the detail gets better and you don't have that much uh, distraction from the reprojection. So that's the other revolution what they did. They made the map tile. Early 2014, I got a phone call. And they said, well, we want to do something with mapping. I thought, oh, that's nice. I've done some find your local beer store and uh, other kinds of nice Google Maps. So maybe, yeah, sure, I can help you. Now, two years later, we created a geo portal for mapping uh, glass fiber connections to the home. So all these, these little flags here, they are projects in the Netherlands and uh, big uh, corporations, they dig all the trenches from the distribution points up to the house. And with the Drupal software, we track how far is this process going, where are your resources, can we move them to a different place to maybe get the deadline and also make the KPI on time so they get their nice bonuses. And in the end, we know about every, oops, about every house, is it connected already, how far is it in the process, and when can these people enjoy their glass fiber internet. Awesome. If you zoom out a little bit in, in a neighborhood, then you see that these are the trenches where it's dug, and light blue are uh, where it's uh, uh, actually constructed, and dark blue is where it is designed. So you can track how far you are with your process of putting stuff in the, in the ground. If we look at it from a technical point of view, it is just default Kartaro. Kartaro is a Drupal distribution, Drupal 7, because development for uh, open layers is nicely built, uh, but not yet fully operational in Drupal 8, as well as all the contrib stuff that you need in order to show the maps. Uh, 
Basically, it eats a GML, which is an XML geospatial data file that gets converted into a geo field that goes into a Java middleware, GeoServer in this case, and then is cached and shown on the map. On the map, this, this part, all, all this top part is Drupal. On the map, you can do styles, behaviors, and add them, mix them in with the map, and as well use external data layers. In the Netherlands, there's a lot of open data, and it's freely distributed by the government, so everybody can use that and make whatever they want with it. So the future for this, especially for Drupal, for, Oh, that's the next slide, sorry. Um, for this product, what I want to do for the third viable is have a different, better solution for files. Since I found out that Drupal is not that excellent in handling files, especially when it comes down to versioning and revisioning. And if you might have time tomorrow at uh, 4 p.m., me and that guy there are going to do a presentation about another solution for handling files. Um, we already did a central authentication with uh, OAuth 2 in order to have users log in at one point and then know in which subsite they are allowed to do their work. The next challenge is to have some leaner geo software than the one that we're using. We'd li like to have a slider and change the time and then see how the progress went and so on. And of course, always when systems are actually used, they get slower and you need more caching to keep happy customers. So for Drupal 8, uh, with regards to mapping, uh, it's very cool that uh, the maintainer of uh, Open Layers, Paul, he redesigned Open Layers 3 on top of the services container which means that it can handle Composer and it wouldn't be a brutal challenge to adapt it in Drupal 8. If you would take the current uh, OpenLens 2.x and you should do it, then pff, it's, no, no, it's not impossible, but it's very, very, very much work. In Drupal 8 server design core, we used a lot of services in order to have uh, specific Drupal websites talk to each other and exchange data. Another thing which could be a nice uh, um, option for integrating mapping in Drupal 8 is MapBender, like the little robot from Futurama. And uh, that is a platform uh, which is built in Symfony and it has a little plugin to have Drupal user authentication, but I didn't get it to work yet. But that could be a nice thing to put on top of as a plugin for Drupal 8. So now we go to city planning. Um, we had a, a local municipality in my village, Eindhoven, and what we did was very easy. We took all the open data that was available about the city, put it on the map, and then just use Drupal as its main functionality, have a CMS, which reference to a certain part of a plan, and then you can track whatever workflow that you've done for this municipality on top of this plan. If you are able to extend that, you could even have a normal civilian point at his house and see how much it could be extended. Or have a query, there is an, in the US already a prototype of that one, if I want to make a hamburger shop, where am I allowed to do that? These kinds of tools you can provide to any civilian that has already paid for all this data. Then it got interesting due to um, SimCity. I bought it specifically for this one because in SimCity you have this, this kind of overhead view modes where you see the statistics in 3D in the environment. That's great. So can we do that with open source? Yes, we can. OpenStreetMap is already working on OSM buildings which contains uh, geometry information, which is 2.5D. So you have the, the shape form. There's like 2040 fine by OSM at this point. So you have the shape of the, the, the roof, 
as well as the height information. So you can draw it in 3D. Another, sorry, take a little sip of water. The next step, of course, is to have it all open source. And uh, the Building Smart Foundation, what they did is they said, well, I cannot read your documents all the time because there's many CAD software and CAD software are one of the worst when it comes to their proprietary file types. So and there's some use cases where you can't even read so, uh, drawings that are created with older versions of the drafting software. So what they did is they made an IFC file, which is an open text file, which contains all the geometry as well as all the metadata. metadata. And they created a specification on what can be in there in forms of elements and sort of data. That means that you don't, if you keep a proper backup, you will never lose the information and you don't have any vendor login. So that made it really, really interesting. Looking at a life cycle, first a building is designed and planned, then it's been built and delivered, then it's operated and managed, and finally you demolish and recycle it. For me, turning this model and using the Drupal website and making it into a product, this phase is the most interesting one because it lasts for around 30 years, 30 years, maybe more. And if you keep track of what you spend and what you updated while the, the, the building is alive, you know how much the rest products are worth and how you can demolish and safely recycle it or not. So we focus on this part first. And this is a very dangerous part because in the construction world, uh, subcontractors are slamming each other with contracts because they're called subcontractors. And I'm not sure if I want to be between those parties making a fight. So in order to have a proper uh, data facilitation, I would take a, uh, between design and planning and building and delivering, you have a model because the designers use the same BIM model. And after it's built, you just measure everything, update the model, and you can compare the two conditions. Why do you want to do that? Very important question. And I believe that is due to that everyone who is in a building or owns a building has the right to know about your own building, to know about your own stuff. And it should not be that the architect who drew the building, that it is his data and it would live on some disk and that nobody can use it. Also, it would be very convenient if you don't need specific knowledge like using uh, a Revit or Archicad CAD drafting software in order to update your models. And of course you can collaborate and work together. So to define that, there is already a term which is called BMS, but I want to recycle that and just call it what it is, a building management system. So you manage everything that is not specific geometry. So you can update and change anything unless you want to have new geometry, then you have a backlog and you send that to the cat room and they can draw that again. Specifically, an example of how you can do uh, interoperability and five years maintenance planning. Um, there is a, a, a standard, just like the ISO, uh, in the Netherlands, which is called the NAN. And it predicts that, just like an atomic bomb, if you have a nuclear explosion, you will have fallout. And every, this is the total lifespan of an element, and halfway it dropped from excellent to be good, and another half extra, etc., until it's a very bad condition. With this, and the input from the owner, what's the key values of the company or the building are, you can determine 
how to manage your building and how to plan it ahead against uh, the, the rental revenues and so on in order to have a nice balance and continuous interest of money because that's what they want. Here comes the Drupal superpower. Since uh, what we did is we made a link from the, all the elements in the building to the Drupal site, we can use any Drupal.org module and link it to the data set. That means that we can do issue queues, uh, documentations, uh, uh, workflows, uh, calendars, and uh, booking of rooms, etc., etc. All these things we have as, as Drupal Power are to be used. Technically, it is uh, you have a BIM server, which is a open source uh, Java. Uh, it's middleware, and it's uh, made by TNO, Dutch research company, which visualizes uh, the, the model. And what we did is have all the, uh, well, this is actually the old roadmap. Uh, since about four months ago, I didn't want to have a monolithic big system anymore who can do everything. I tear it apart, threw away one and a half year of work, and we are going to refactor it and work with small microservices where this is in itself a service, but it can be instances at many places, and do a specific task. And the Drupal sites will be central, like a little spider, Drupal spider in the, in the web of all the services, and they will have it interoperable. Future ideas are still the same. Uh, use uh, sensors and actors inside the buildings, and use the sensor data in order to enrich the data model. And in the end, if you have the, lots of data, especially here in the sensor part, uh, you obviously want to do uh, BI, big data, and uh, those kind of things. So the first goal is to finish what we're doing now, but then in a split up way. That's the five years maintenance planning. Then the next challenge, which is a very difficult one, is, is to find a solution um, it's, it's one of the most universal IT solutions in order to capture expert logic. If you talk with a cost calculator, he's thinking in Excel spreadsheets with all these little squares and his, he has his formulas in there. But per expert group, there is a different way of how they want to use the software. So something universal you want in order to link that all together. Uh, currently, the viewer is Scene.js. It's pretty nice, it works. If there's time, I can show it. Um, but I really want to go to 3.js for it's much faster and it's better to program against it. So, like I said before, at the real-time sensors, and everything that we do and build will be uh, GPL2, Drupal.org, and in that way, it can be used all around the world and just give a lot more profit to all of us. Uh, then, going into the internet of everything, there's four billion people around the world. We have about four trillion dollar we spend every year on the, the, all, all, the, all our devices. There's a lot of apps, 25 million, and this is all about 2020. Uh, each person will have like five screens, and we will move 50 trillion gigabytes per week on data. It's quite a lot. But we're not there yet. Not there yet. What can we do now? There's nice inexpensive hardware like uh, the Arduino or the Raspberry Pi, or even uh, if you want more cores, there's 16 in this little parallela. It costs 100 euros, and with that you have some more computing power to hook up to your sensors and send this data all around for us to process and to make added value with. On the Raspberry Pi, there's little motion sensors, so 45 plus 35, so under 80 euros, you have a room tester, so you know who is in the room. What can you do with that information? You know this room is used this much, so you know when to clean it or not. 
because if a room isn't used, it doesn't have to be cleaned as thorough as it would have been when it's used a lot. Another thing I bought is this little uh, transceiver. And what it can do, it can operate with uh, IKEA stuff, with Philips uh, U, it can do with uh, heating, it can do the uh, blinds. Just by having consumer hardware and linking it up to this little device, hooking it up to a Linux server, and you can control and automate your whole, in my case, office. Another nice thing is just a Kickstarter uh, from the Netherlands is the YPy. So if you know how to program Python, this is one of the easiest ways to get going. And this thing is pretty interesting for it has LoRa. And LoRa is the new Wi-Fi for things, which reaches much further away um, and has a uh, Didn't find time yet to start playing with this one, but I bought it already. Then we get to how do these things communicate together? And there's lots of protocols all around. And I'm going to focus on one, which is called MQTT, Message Queuing Telemetry Transport. It's an open standard. It exists for about the longest period. And it's optimized for low bandwidth. And it's data agnostic. And it's supported by some very big companies amongst IBM and Facebook. It's a standard. Yes, it's a standard for 10 years now. One of the older ones. And the cool thing about it is that it has here at the bottom a fire and forget mechanism. So the device will have data and it will just send it out. And around there is mesh functionality in order to have its endpoint receive the data. And instead of uh, doing it with, uh, for example, HTTP, you just send two bytes uh, for sending a hello world package. And it works one to n. So if one device has information and shares it, all the things around it can use the same information. Looks like this for the Hello World example in code. And uh, for implementing this stuff, there is a nice sand sandbox uh, for Drupal 8, just to play with. Um, if you want to use it and collect it and have some, make some sand out of it, you need something like a message broker, a middleware, to collect all this data and then abstract it. Um, so that my, uh, Rabbit MQ is a, like a hub to divide it. And there is uh, Java middleware available of whom one or two are free and others are payware. Uh, another way in experiments when it's not so scalable, you could play around with uh, Node.js and make a custom runner. Now we have all this data in this in the system, and uh, the next step would be to have it accessible from the web. Uh, just how Wikipedia got to be big is have it semantic, so it's not a matter of looking at a website and reading text, no. You want to expose the, the data in the database and have other people or other systems interact with that data. Uh, for that, we have nice options in Drupal with a, a, a Sparkle, it's a query language on top of RDF, uh, the RDF module, and there, for Drupal 8, there is the uh, RDF UI, and it has an LD tool, but the LD tool is broken at this moment. Maybe someone will fix it. Um, another thing for querying uh, that we found out recently, well, recently, it's about half a year now, um, is Fubi. He was, he's building uh, GraphQL for Drupal 8. And uh, GraphQL is awesome because you just ask it, show me your schema. And then it will tell you all the options and all the questions it can answer. Uh, also, its UI is visual, so it do auto complete when you're querying. And I have the idea that with uh, GraphQL, we can replace 
all our rest interfaces that are currently bothering. What, did, did, what field name did this guy use? All these, this kind of problems it will solve. Since you just take the set of data and use that in the query instead of thinking or calling or emailing and asking what's your field name. So all in all, <coughs> we have a, um, let's say a neighborhood with houses and buildings. We have open data about that. So we can project it on the element itself or on the map. And then sensors in the environment, sensors in the homes. Having these things collide and work together, it's, it's really, really great. That with that you can do anything. But also, of course, be aware that you're not exposing data that you don't want to. Oh well. Um, I'd like to, if there's time, I hope so, uh, organize a buff about around these kinds of ideas. And of course, yeah, on the other side there's sprints. So you can always look around and have a chat. Thank you. Ah, oh, there's 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes time for questions? No? Yes? Yes, uh, you know, a question, but more or less is what you show about the sensors, that's uh, something that at least I've seen in place, because uh, my company moved to uh, their headquarters in Finland, mm -hmm. in the Philippines, they are sharing the building with Microsoft, so they put in those kind of sensors in all the meeting rooms, all the shared spaces, and they have uh, temperature, humidity, uh, noise, uh, presence, um, they develop as well a, a visualization tool. So mm -hmm. you can see many people that they carry a, an NFC tag. So yeah. you can see them, you know, if they are in one meeting room, mm -hmm. if you want to look for your manager or something, these kind of things are still very useful. And also for yes. putting meeting rooms on this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I really, really like uh, your approach. Yes, and that's also what we want to include. For example, the building that is being drawn now. Well, is it? Or maybe you should make it bigger. It's a very small screen. Yeah, there it is. This is my office space. It's an old school, like old school. And uh, I want to place the sensors in there and then show this as a present, for, okay, we can, we can build it like this, and maybe you want it to buy it, etc. those kind of things. So have the visual component as well as uh, the actual information. And while doing that, uh, save the planet a little bit. So the heater can turn down itself, uh, blinds can come down when needed, because else we can't see our screens anymore, and so on. Yeah? Uh, sorry, we're using a, a group of concerts with the Nikons for retail, so for uh, you know have a more or less interaction with your the visitors in our buildings. Let's say there is a customer, they have an application installed, mm -hmm. then the building is aware of the customer jumping into the to the and then probably it activates a map mm -hmm. and guides the customer to the meeting room for example. This kind of things mm -hmm. are really really good, but we need maps within this kind of 3D visualization yes. mapping. So but now the future uh, right now is uh, this kind of things. So they make uh, our lives like even more interesting. Uh, yeah, 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 interesting. Yeah, yeah. And with, with the beacons and the near field, it's all about budget. For if, if it may cost two or three euros per beacon, yes. then the eye beacons are yes. the, the thing. The is manage mm -hmm. the That's the only thing. So that I was thinking as well about the building a platform for managing a large amount of beacons. The other thing that you need is the beacon, you know, the ID, the unique ID, and more or less what you want is to do this message to send. Mm -hmm. This is all this metadata that we pull out of the... In every asset, 
Everything, yes. Yes. This is not live data. It's only the, the, the static stuff that it, it is being drawn up. And combining that with the live stuff, you can make great, great solutions. And I'm not sure you the demo day of the visualization that we have. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's the same, but you're making a desk, and you know if the desk is in use or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. But also you have statistics of the usage of the desk. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a, a layout in the office that you can put the desks in different areas depending on the usage. And some desks are not used at all, they put them in another place, but they are needed. Yeah. So it's like to optimize in your office, your mm -hmm. work space. Yeah. Yeah. And, and people also get little shocks when they sit all the time at the same place at the room, no? <laughs> Anybody else have a question or a remark or an idea? No? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.